This coming week marks the anniversary of the Alamo, the classic story and admittedly also extremely tragic of how 185 Texans fought off 1,800 Mexican soldiers and died in the process. I decided not only to watch the famous 1960 John Wayne directed American epic, but also revisit the 2004 version and I have some reevaluating to do. About what? Well, let's take a deeper look right here. Ever since I was a kid, the story of the Alamo has fascinated me. And admittedly, it was because of the John Wayne movie. I remember it being on TCM one day, and I was just floored by it. Uh, and then I, of course, saw Disney's Davy Crockett, and my imagination just grew and grew and grew about the story. I had little army soldiers, uh, and I would build the Alamo Fort and recreate the battle over and over and over and over and over again. I even soon bought myself a coonskin hat, uh, and I would go outside and pretend I was either in Sam Houston's army or actually in the Alamo itself. And I remember full well, when the 2004 version of the film came out, I saw the trailers and I was just yearning to go see this, despite my young age. I just needed to go see this movie. But that movie, the 2004 version, was a gargantuan flop, and it never had a chance visiting the movie theaters where I grew up in, because they were small and nobody really went to see movies anyways. It didn't have a chance. So I forgot about it until one day it showed up on DVD at my local library. Of course, I took that out and I watched the crap out of it, having loved the John Wayne version, uh, which I still do, by the way, despite it you know, having blatant historical inaccuracies everywhere. But after I saw the 2004 version, I thought it was boring. It just wasn't as good as the Duke's version or as entertaining. Uh, as entertaining. But what I knew after seeing it was that this movie was definitely, the 2004 version was more historically accurate. This was the more historically accurate version. I'd still say this is the most accurate version of the battle told thus far, at least on film. But this was my overall opinion of the film. Literally until the other day. And now, I'm really having a hard time telling which version I prefer, Wayne's version or the 2004 version. There's no point of really deciding. There, there really isn't any point. But for some reason on this viewing, I found myself adoring the costumes, the creative cinematography, the sets. Holy Jesus, that Alamo set was gorgeous. But surprisingly, the characters as well. I found myself noticing details I just didn't before, like Davy Crockett seeing the, the little um, Tejanos. I believe that's how you pronounce it, the Tejanos. Uh, those are people who are Mexican but consider themselves Texan. Uh, th that little boy, he notices that boy when he first arrives in town, only to see that same boy again just before he puts up his final fight. Or the man holding the dog, holding, you know, holding on to said dog as the silhouettes of the Mexican soldiers appear on the Alamo mission itself. Wonderful, wonderful shot. It's the little details like that in a movie, of any kind really, that just make my mouth water. One flaw with the 2004 version is it doesn't really explain too well why Texas was in rebellion against Mexico. I, d I don't really think it could because this was something that stretched way back, even to the early 1800s, nor does it really explain who Santa Ana is and why he was so formidable and why he became dictator. In fact, the movie actually reminds me a lot of Waterloo in 1970. I think Waterloo is a better movie, by the way, but that movie expects you to know this stuff. And the truth is, many people don't know this stuff, which is why I th a good chunk of why I think both movies flopped. That's despite the fact that I know what happened and the whys in the house. I, I do know that, and admittedly, that helped my enjoyment of these movies. Now, the battle itself is beautifully presented in the movie, in probably the most realistic way as well. In fact, the scale of the battles themselves, uh, even the Battle of San Juancento at the end of the film, is probably the most accurately portrayed version of the battle ever put to film. Now I actually know the numbers that actually fought here. The Texans had roughly somewhere between 185 and 200 people 
in the mission. The Mexicans had anywhere from 1,500 to around 2,300 soldiers. The most, the number that a lot of people tend to arrive on are 1,800, so that's the number that I'm using here. And it made me laugh, but, you know, now I look at the John Wayne version, and John Wayne's version wound up actually having more people in the movie than the actual battle that took place in real life. But I always ask myself, why? didn't Santa Ana just keep pushing to take the fort? Why wait? 185 people? That's nothing. Immediately, something that I loved in the 2004 version is I adore the fact that this movie bothered to go into the details of how well-built the fort actually was. I mean, yeah, it was kind of a falling-apart mission, but it was a well-defended fort. It had thick walls, good marksmen, cannons with grape shot made of forks, stones, knives, nails, etc., 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 that'll just tear apart your guts if you're anywhere near it, so just wanted to point that out. And if I learned anything from studying military history, attacking a fort in any way will mean a lot of bloodshed. Let's look at a couple of examples. Why don't we look at the Confederates going up after the 20th Maine at Gettysburg? And Chamberlain didn't even have a fort. He just had the woods to basically provide him some cover and look how much, in, and some stones, look how much damage he caused. Or the Zulus at Rourke's Drift in 1879. The movie goes out of its way to talk about their tactics at attacking the Alamo itself, and, and I really adored that. So let's break down the numbers then for a little bit. The Texans all died, at least 185 people, at least 185 people, probably a little bit more. And the Mexicans lost what we think was somewhere between 500 and 700 men taking the fort. That means Santa Ana lost a little under half of his full assault force taking that fort. <laughs> I don't care what you say. The, the decision to attack meant that they had to be careful with how they expanded their forces, how they used them, how they attacked with them. This wasn't like Napoleon or the Russians over in Europe over 20 years earlier, where they conjured up hundreds of thousands of men. This wasn't like that. This is an area with much less people, but with a gargantuan size of land to cover. I mean, almost the size of a good chunk of Europe can fit into this one area. And I'm really glad that the movie brings up this detail. Something that does puzzle me in this movie is the film's treatment of Santa Ana himself. It's basically the movie's villain. Well, duh, right? Of course he's going to be your villain in a movie about the Alamo. But he's portrayed as a literal villain. He's slimy. He even has an evil laugh during the final battle. And I, that's not saying that this movie vilifies the Mexicans. It doesn't. In fact, the movie blatantly goes out of its, out of its way to, to humanize the Mexican soldiers, even many of the subordinate generals. It blatantly humanizes them. But ironically, and, and people can fight me on this. This is fine. Ironically, I think John Wayne's version does a better job here at portraying the Mexicans in a respectful light. By not giving us any POVs of the Mexican army, it made them more frightening. That movie also just portrayed them in a more respectful light. And, and two scenes in the 1960 version comes to mind where, where it embodies my opinion here. One is when Santa Ana arrives. We only see him riding in the front of the columns. A couple of Kentuckians say, That's the best dressed army I ever saw. Fancy clothes don't make a fighting man. They're just off two years putting down revolts. They're fighting men. And I love this scene. It's both intimidating and respectful all at the same time. The next scene is the ending, when Captain Dickinson's wife leaves the Alamo after everyone is killed. Santa Anna, his only lines, by the way, in the entire movie, orders his men to stand and salute, and then takes off his own hat as he lets her leave, in a sign of respect. In the 2004 version, the portrayal of Santa Anna is that of a villain, with no nuance, unlike just about everyone else in the movie, which is one reason why he kind of stands out in not necessarily a good way. So when we see soldiers shouting, Viva Santa Ana, you know, while they're storming the Alamo, we don't really ever understand why. And it's a shame, because I think diving into the complexity of a man who started off as a federalist, meaning little central government, to a centrist, meaning somewhere in the middle, all the way to slashing the Mexican constitution and declaring himself dictator would be fascinating. And we don't need to know all of that, per se. Just don't make him a pervy, creepy, evil man. Show him thinking. And with all that said, I cannot and will not deny that Santa Ana, by this point in his career, 
was an egomaniac in every way, shape, and form. What I would have done, if given the chance to make my own movie on the Alamo, I would have concluded Santa Ana's arc during the execution of Davy Crockett. I'd have the generals and staff all pleading to spare Davy Crockett's life, only then to have Santa Ana crack and his descent into madness is complete. Yeah, maybe that wouldn't be you know, as historically accurate as perhaps what we got in the film, or other portrayals, and so on and so forth. Maybe he was already gone, he'd already gone crazy by this point in reality. But I think narratively, it would work at telling the story a little bit better. And it would serve as a binding element between Santa Anna and Davy Crockett, having their arcs complete at the same time. Speaking of Davy Crockett... In contrast to Santa Anna, a character I thought the movie knocked out of the park is Davy Crockett. This is hands down the best interpretation I've seen of him put to film. Hands down. If it was just me, simple old David from Tennessee, I might drop over that wall some night and take my chances. But that Davy Crockett feller, they're all watching him. See, I love this line. I just adore this line. It sums up not just his character, but who the real Davy Crockett is in a nutshell. This is a man who had everything. Was a promising celebrity and politician. Could have even been president, how famous he was. But made some stupid mistakes. One of them being his defense of Native Americans, their stake on some of the land that President Jackson, in his Indian Removal Act, he threw away a good chunk of his career by defending the Native Americans. And I, I just wish to bring that out. I didn't know this until a little while ago, and I was shocked to learn about all this. And because of that, and some other things later on, he lost an election. So, of course, he's actually seduced by the promise of Texas, a frontier where he can just start all over. In fact, that's why a lot of people go to Texas, and that's a theme in this movie. And I love the scene with Crockett and Sam, Hew Sam Houston at the beginning. Yeah, I know the timelines aren't quite lined up correctly. Apparently this happened a few years before the conversation takes place in the film, but this is a good example, this scene, of exposition sounding natural within dialogue. Sam is seducing Crockett of Texas, and of course Crockett takes the bite. Hell, Sam Houston was a failed politician too, fleeing to Texas to start all over. So of, cor of course Crockett would be interested in that. And that's why a lot of people who fought at the Alamo fought at the Alamo. They went to Texas, at that point Mexico, with the promise of a new frontier, n new experiences, a chance to basically begin again, to start all over, a new start. Which this brings up, you know, Davy Crockett's arc within the movie. Each version of the Alamo I've seen, it's shown that Davy, David Crockett, comes to Texas as almost like a like a suicide mission, and this one's no exception. And again, this isn't like a literal suicide, uh, you know, mission, but as a chance for Davy Crockett to redeem himself and fight for what he and his fellow Kentuckians see as a just cause. The John Wayne version certainly does this, and the 2004 version also does this in a slightly more realistic way. This just isn't the truth. In reality, Davy Crockett came to Texas because of what I said before. He winds up getting wrapped up in the Texas Revolution, even taunting Santa Ana in a newspaper reportedly saying, have Santa Ana's head. He, he and his men would have Santa Ana's head. Now, I'd like to see this played out in the movie. But that's not saying what we get in the 2004 version isn't bad. Far, far from it. Crockett's arc is simple but effective, more so here than in any other movie. Certainly blows Wayne's version out of the water, I'm just going to say that right now. He's a bit overwhelmed by his reputation, he's been humiliated, he's looking for adventure again, and I've stated a few examples earlier of, of, of what was going on here. And by the end of the movie, when he's captured and executed, Crockett has come to terms with who he is as America's first celebrity, really. He puts on that old Crockett charm one last time to taunt Santa Ana, forfeiting his life, which probably would have happened regardless, knowing the state of mind Santa Ana was in at the time. And again, this is a simple arc. There's nothing groundbreaking or even extraordinary here. 
but it's just well done. But while the movie shows the nuances of Davy Crockett and shows us who the man was instead of an idealized version, we do see what made the man so special. I love the inclusion of him playing the fiddle to help cheer up the men, or hell, the, the scene where he musically duels with the Mexican band is, is downright beautiful. It's my favorite scene in the movie. Regardless of if that happened or not, it's certainly something I could see the real Davy Crockett doing. Another great example is when the 32 men from Gonzales show up, and while Travis and even Davy know that those numbers are far, far too small to make much of a difference, Davy puts on a smile and throws a cheer for those 32 men, regardless of if they would do much of a difference or not. The results are the other men feeling more at ease and even having their morale boosted. That to me, is who Davy Crockett was. How he got famous, his charisma, his charm, and Billy Bob Thornton fucking nails it. Watch this movie for his performance, if nothing else. As for Lieutenant Colonel Travis and Jim Bowie, the 2004 version does a good job at showing their budding heads in a way far more realistic than in the 1960s version. What this movie and other subsequent versions, failed to mention is that Travis was not just an advocate for Texan independence, being a member of the War Party. They failed to mention he was an advocate for slavery. And not just that, but extremely vocal and even militant about getting escaped slaves back, who ran to Mexico for freedom, back to their proper slave owners in the South. I won't deny that this really did tarnish my view of the man, and yeah, I know I'm looking at that through the lens of someone in the 21st century, but still, I can't deny that. I, I do not tolerate slavery whatsoever. In fact, the more I read about Travis, the more I despise the man, <laughs> and also think that he wasn't the meek man we see in the 2004 version. I'd go as far as to say that Lawrence Harvey's performance in the 1960 version is a far more accurate portrayal of his personality than the nervous, inexperienced man we see in the 2004 version. Now, with that being said, what they do in the 2004 version is really great at setting both Travis and Bowie apart from one another despite them wanting basically the same thing. Bowie in this movie is absolutely wonderful. It beautifully shows his brashness, his ambitions, his drinking problems, and yet you never hate the guy. My only complaint with him is that I think he's too young in the movie, and that's it. The movie doesn't need to tell you that he made his forge his fortune basically by forging signatures uh, and stealing money from the United States uh, for you to understand that Bowie has a questionable past. You kind of inference it as you watch the movie and you know that he's come to Texas to start over just like everyone else and I love that. And while Travis may be a better tactician on paper, Bowie is the one who not only has the clout to command but also the respect around him to actually pull it off. And I adore that dynamic. And Davy Crockett kind of has to play a, mediate, a mediary person, which I, I, I like that not just this version captures. I always thought the 1961 did extremely well at this, too. And I love how this movie, the 2004 version, depicts the two men putting their differences aside in the name of their common cause, which was the independence of Texas. The scene they finally see eye to eye is when Travis picks up the unexploded shell fired at the Alamo and has it fired back at the Mexicans. I have no clue if that really happened. Probably not, but I don't care. Thematically, the scene is absolutely beautiful. Now, before this moment, Travis has talked the talk, but he hasn't really walked the walk. Compare that to Jim Bowie, and even Davy Crockett, and he's clearly the weakest of the three commanders. But when Travis actually does what he says, walks up to the shell, cuts off the fuse, and picks it up with his bare hands, it proves to Bowie just what Travis is capable of. He gains respect for Travis in that moment, and henceforth they become a good team, even though Bowie is getting sicker and sicker with tuberculosis, which props to the movie for accurately depicted Jim Bowie's ailment, unlike most versions which have him just wounded or getting hurt in some way. Truth is, Jim Bowie was on his deathbed by the time the final attack occurred, and that's not knocking his bravery at all. It's just a fact. So yeah, in the end, I found myself really enjoying this version. Really enjoying it. And while I was reading reviews, I couldn't help but shake my head at what most people were complaining about, particularly on IMDb, which was this movie having a lack of character development. I mean, as I said before, it's nothing groundbreaking. 
but it didn't need to be, nor should it have been. I think the filmmakers really paid attention to history, and with a couple of exceptions, stuck to what we knew and how these people probably would have interacted with each other. On top of that, we have some amazing costumes, some great set design, great cinematography, and a music score which doesn't play up the epic tone of the story like in the 1960 version, but instead reins everything in to make it a personal journey from beginning to end. I definitely call this movie an underrated gem, that's for sure. I'm really glad I rewatched it, and if you don't care for this version, I'd recommend checking it out again, even if you feel the same way as before you know, that you still don't like it. I think the movie at least deserves a second viewing. And I can't deny that it being the most historically accurate version of the story didn't hurt one bit, not gonna lie. So, in the end, go on Facebook, like, and Productions for all up-to-date information of what we are doing. Make sure to subscribe to the AN Productions Archive channel, which is full of all of our live content, clips from our live content on specific details, lots of great videos talking about Godzilla, about history, etc., etc., etc. Make sure to go check that, check that out. All of my social media is in the description below. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions saying, sign off.